All right, let's uh, go ahead and get started. Uh, I'll pray for us. Father, thank you uh, for this semester and keeping us uh, safe from COVID and allowing us to still be face to face. Thank you for that. I pray as we finish out the semester with these a little more than two and a half weeks uh, left, I pray you help us finish well. Um, And I pray that you'll use all of these classes as a means of grace for us to Help us think uh, your thoughts after you in a way that will bring you uh, great honor and glory. And we pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, uh, please uh, take attendance uh, quiz uh, 36. If you ever have a problem with any of those attendance quizzes, if you just uh, email me, I'll make sure that you uh, that gets uh, sorted out. Uh, we're looking at Romans uh, 13 and 14 today. Uh, this is discussion 36. Uh, we only have 43 total, so that means they're only uh, counting this class. There are only seven more class periods, which that's crazy to me. Um, uh, remember to work on your memory verses and your textbooks. Readings, uh, I'm allowing you to pledge the textbook reading, so whenever you finish, or if you do a percentage of that, if you go on there and say, I read 50% of the textbook or whatever, uh, I can give you the points for whatever you did on that. But I do encourage you to uh, work on the memory verses as well, because uh, one, if you do well on that and have met the other criteria, you exempt yourself from uh, the uh, final, Um, but it's uh, long enough of a passage that if you wait till the night before to try to do it, um, it'll overload your brain. Um, So you need to uh, start. And I did a thing for you. Um, If you're trying to learn the literal translation, you can use any one you want, but if you're using that literal one, I did put a PowerPoint on there, and uh, it's like each word. Um, so if you want to test yourself uh, with that PowerPoint, when I memorize things, that's how I do it. And so uh, I put, um, I think it's in the announcement, uh, and I think it's, 438 words or something that we're memorizing. So if you, uh, if that's how you memorize, uh, you may want to use uh, that um, um, if you uh, so desire. So uh, we're going to look at uh, Romans uh, 13, and everything from 12 to 16 in Romans is all about ethics. Uh, how should you live as a believer? Paul is working to bring together uh, Jewish Christians, Gentile Christians in Rome. And so he gave the doctrinal basis for it. And then uh, 12 and following are kind of practical things. Uh, 13 is an important passage for us because it says, let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God and those that exist have been instituted by God. And that means that the default position for Christians in regard to governing authorities is to be uh, law-abiding, peace-seeking, good citizens. Um, uh, To honor God, you need to be subject to the governing authorities. So when uh, someone says in the name of Christ, you know, uh, we need to rise up and overthrow. Uh, there's a huge problem with that in terms of Romans uh, 13. And in our day where there's such a political divide, um, it means that we as Christians uh, owe as Christians Um, a certain goodness to the people who are governing us. And it doesn't matter which side of the aisle 
you're on. Uh, Romans 13 is pretty clear. Uh, be subject uh, to those who are over you. And so I wonder if kind of how we've devolved to this kind of Twitter war and, you know, uh, just kind of demonizing uh, the other side. I wonder if that you can really say that that's living up to what Paul is telling us to do in Romans uh, 13, to uh, seek to live quiet and peaceful lives, to seek to submit uh, to whoever's in authority over us. Paul says, whoever resists the authorities resists God, resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. This is the normal way it works out. So the advice uh, from God, the instruction from God uh, to Christians is uh, try to live a quiet and peaceful life, um, submit to the authorities, pay taxes to the authorities. Now, what makes this a really interesting passage is the historical fact of who was in control when Paul wrote this. Um, Paul is saying he's God's servant for good. If you do wrong, be afraid. He does not bear the sword in vain. Uh, for he is servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Uh, government has the function of suppressing evil, uh, of protecting the citizens. Uh, let me read this and then we'll look at who was in control. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God. And if my memory serves me right, uh, uh, it's the Greek word light, erges. Uh, we get the word liturgy from it, so it's almost a, a worshiping word. Um, for authorities are a liturgist of God attending to this very thing, Pay to all what is owed them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. So Paul is saying, be a good citizen, pay your taxes, submit to the authority. What's really interesting about what Paul writes is the person who was in control um, if Paul's writing this, say, 55 A.D., um, then the person who was in control at that time was Nero. Um, he became um, emperor when he was 16 or 17 years old. He died before he turned 31. Uh, he had been adopted by Claudius, and when Claudius died, he took over uh, as Claudius adopted Son, eventually he was overthrown by the Senate and he died by suicide. This is, this is a person who killed Paul. Uh, Nero ended up killing Peter and Paul. Um, and this is what his life was like. So when uh, Paul's talking about submitting to governing authorities, um, this is what Nero's life was like, and the next uh, slides are going to be a little bit uh, out there. Um, uh, you may want to look away. It's not visual, but uh, you may want to not listen to it. But this is what Suetonius, a contemporary uh, writer, roughly contemporary writer, wrote about Nero. And this is in his book, uh, The Twelve Caesars. Uh, uh, he's chapter six. Um, so this 
boy who became emperor at 16 or 17 years old um, raped boys. Um, uh, he abused freeborn boys, seduced married women, uh, raped the Vestal Virgin Rubia. He married a freed woman, that is an ex-slave, um, named Octe, after bribing some uh, ex-consuls to perjure themselves to swear she was of royal birth. So he was kind of out there in terms of uh, sexual perversion. And you may not want to listen to this or look at it, but this is what Suetonius says. He turned the boy Sporus into a woman by castration, married him in the usual manner, including bridal veil and dowry, took him off to the palace attended by a vast crowd and proceeded to treat him as his wife. Uh, in other words, he was married to a... Uh, transgendered man that he presented as a woman as the emperor of Rome. She, he, what, whatever you want to say, they were a married couple. And that led to the joke going rounds to the fact that it would have been better if Nero's father had married that kind of wife. Nero took Sporus decked out as an empress regalia. This is the transgendered uh, man to all the Greek assizes and markets in his litter and later through the Sigillaria quarter in Rome, kissing him fondly now and then. And then this one is really bad. Uh, you may not want to look, or, but this is what Suetonius says. Uh, Nero harbored a notorious passion for his own mother, but was prevented from consummating it by the actions of her enemies who feared the proud and headstrong woman would acquire too much uh, uh, great influence. His desire was more apparent after he found a new courtesan who was the very image of Agrippina, Agrippina as his mother uh, for his harem, so they wouldn't let him marry his woman, uh, his mother, so he got a woman who looked just like his mother uh, for his harem. Um, and you may not want to listen to this, but like he, Suetonius says, he thinks Nero consummated that desire uh, with his mother. And then this one's the worst of all. Um, he debased himself sexually to the extent that exploiting every aspect of the body, he invented an erotic game. Well, I'm not even going to read it. Um, but uh, basically the ultimate limits of perversity Nero gave himself over to. Um, he took uh, aphrodisiacs to the point that it broke his mind. Uh, I think he slept with his own sister. He killed his sister. He killed his mother. Um, eventually, uh, and we're going to see this, but I want you to hear this verse. Okay, that's our guy. And then Paul says, be subject to the governing authorities. Okay, how bad should it get before Christians should not submit? I think think it should get pretty bad. Uh, I can't think, I don't know how you could have a worse person than Nero. Um, and Paul's saying, well, don't take my word for it. Uh, Paul, as he's about to get killed, this is what he says. First of all, I urge that supplication, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority. So think of what Suetonius has just described, this drug addict, pervert, um, every possible thing wrong. And Paul says, 
I want you to find a way to pray for that guy for his good that we can live a quiet and peaceful life. That seems to say to me that anything that we would criticize people for today is less than what Paul was facing uh, then. Um, Paul says, try to find a way to thank God for Nero. Try to find a way to thank God for Nero. Try to Try to find a way in that horrible governing person. Try to find a way to live a quiet and peaceful life. This is good and pleasing in the sight of God our Savior who desires all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Um, God is calling us to a radical goodness in the face of massive evil. Um, and the only way we can do that is uh, with God's help. It gets worse for Nero. Um, the more drugs he took, uh, the crazier he got. And he was greedy. Um, he used to do this deal where he would set somebody's house on fire and then he would go and say, do you want to sell your house to me? And if they said no, he would just let the house burn down. But if they said yes and at a vastly you know, undervalued price, he had trained slaves to be the first fire department. And so that's what he would do. He'd set people's houses on fire and then when they sold the house, he'd put the fire out and that's how he acquired uh, his wealth. But one day, he was doing that and the wind changed and the slave fire department couldn't put the fire out and um, a massive portion of Rome burnt down. And he was in big trouble then. I mean, all that crazy stuff he did it's like, okay, he's the emperor, but when people start losing money, it's like, we got to get rid of this guy. And Nero needed a scapegoat, and he turned to Christians. Um, people would hear uh, about uh, Christian worship and uh, this thing called a love feast. And, of course, they were talking about uh, loving your Christian brother and sister and the Lord's Supper. But when Nero told it, um, it was cannibalism and incest. And so uh, he accused uh, the fire being the result of the gods' um, anger at the cannibalism and incest of Christians. And so he started killing Christians and uh, dipped Christians in tar and set them on fire in his garden and invited people to come party uh, with him at the start of the uh, Neronian persecutions. Eusebius of Caesarea uh, in his Ecclesiastical Histories 2.25 says, while the rule was now being strengthened by Nero, he directed his course into unholy pursuits and began to arm himself against a religion dedicated to the God of the universe. It would not be part of the present study to describe the depravity of such a man as this one became. Evidently, Eusebius had read Suetonius. Um, since many, to be sure, have handed down uh, his story, or I, I don't have the dates. I don't know if Suetonius was before or after uh, Eusebius, but they're talking about the same facts. Since many, to be sure, have handed down his story in most uh, accurate descriptions, it is possible for anyone at his pleasure to examine from them the crudeness of the man's degenerate madness. So Eusebius uh, wrote that in about 325. Under his influence, he accomplished the death of so many thousands, 
quite without reason, and reached such a state of blood guiltiness that he spared neither his nearest nor dearest in various ways alike, brought to death his mother, his brothers, his wife, as well as thousands of other family members as if they were enemies and foes. Yet with all these crimes there still remained this to be written about him, that he would be the first of the emperors uh, to be pointed out as a foe of divine religion. God, in his generosity to unbelievers, ordered Christians to submit to Nero, to be good people, to pray for him. And Nero responded by living a debauched life and burning them as lights in his uh, garden. Uh, I think God is showing us uh, that people people can be truly evil. Um, Eusebius says, Thus then was this man heralded as above all the first fighter against God and was raised up and was raised up to slaughter the apostles. It's recorded that Paul was beheaded in Rome itself and that Peter also was crucified in Nero's time. And the title of Peter and Paul over the cemeteries there, uh, which was prevailed to the present day, confirms this story. I don't know if you know this, but the Vatican is built over uh, the cemetery that uh, Eusebius is uh, talking about. In fact, uh, what's it called? Uh, the the main uh, church in St. Peter's Basilica, yeah, is built over the exact uh, um, cemetery, uh, which has prevailed to the present day confirmed story, no less, as does a man of the church named Caius, uh, who lived in the time of Zephyrinus, Bishop of Rome. Now, having said all that, it's interesting, F.F. Uh, F. Bruce quotes uh, T.R. Glover, who made the point that when Paul stood before Nero and was condemned, that the day would come when men would name their dogs Nero and their sons Paul. Um, God had the church, Christian church, submit, but God was showing all of us of all time that um, evil people, you can love evil people, and some people are going to be evil people. Uh, that was the case with Nero. And it raises an issue um, about how Christians should respond to evil in the world. Uh, it's clear, and Paul says it, owe oh, nothing to anyone except to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, don't commit adultery, don't murder, don't steal, don't covet, and any other commandment are summed up in the word, you will love your neighbor as yourself. So a lot of people, when you come to Romans 13, uh, and you say, okay, it's God's will for Christians to uh, submit to evil, to, to pray for those. But the question comes up, is that always the case? Uh, is there ever a case where under the principle of loving your neighbor as yourself that you'll defend your neighbor? And um, that's an interesting question um, because the church by and large has said yes. There is a case where things can get so bad that not to take up arms would be not loving your neighbor. Um, imagine um, you know if uh, if there were a 
group in a, a chapel somewhere and a maniac uh, kicked the door in and it was a Christian chapel, what would the Christian response be? Well, the church has said in that case, it, to love your neighbor as yourself means to defend your neighbor and to oppose evil. And that go that view goes back at least to Augustine. Um, and I have to admit, I find that argument completely convincing um, that I as a Christian believe that uh, I'm called to submit to the government, um, to pray for those over me, uh, to uh, seek to show honor even when perhaps people don't deserve honor. But I do believe for me as a Christian that there is a place where uh, loving your neighbor as yourself means defending your neighbor. But that's where the messiness comes because I don't think that argument, at least for me, is a one-size-fits-all. When I look at Nero's, what Nero did um, and the call uh, to submit, that makes me think that um, we as Christians should pursue that until it's just completely unreasonable. But I, I do think that church history is right. And if Jesus is saying the ultimate um, commandment, the commandment which all other commandments fit under in terms of our ethical response to other people, is uh, to love our neighbors ourselves, which means defending, uh, at least for me, defending uh, my neighbor. But the messiness of that is clear to me because people have used that argument uh, for all kinds of things that I would not agree with. Um, um, they've, uh, I think you would call that hierarchical ethics. And, you know, the standard thing would be if you were in World War II and you were hiding uh, Jews in your attic and the Gestapo came and said, are you hiding Jews in your attic? What would... Uh, the most moral Christian response be, well, it would be to lie through your teeth and to say, I have no Jews. Under the principle of preserving life is more important than um, not telling a lie. Um, I totally agree with that ethical approach, but it's messy because people have used that to defend all kinds of things, uh, political assassinations, uh, um, and, and so in coming to the text, for me, every time I read through Romans uh, 13 and I, I think about my hierarchical ethics and I think about Paul and Nero, I wonder if I'm going to that argument too quickly. Uh, I'm wondering if uh, it really is as cut and dried as I would uh, make it. Have, have any of you uh, worked through that ethical issue or thought about that ethical issue before? Um, it's interesting, both sides in the Civil War uh, were using those arguments. Uh, 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 Abraham Lincoln uh, was pointing out, uh, you know, uh, both sides uh, claim uh, the favor of God and uh, maybe he's on neither side. Uh, but then he says, uh, I don't know how you can love your neighbors yourself and own your neighbor. Um, so that whole messiness of this particular issue has played out a number of times. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, uh, a great uh, a German writer, uh, tried to kill Hitler uh, under this uh, principle, and Hitler hung him uh, uh, for it a few days before Hitler uh, committed suicide. Um, so Romans 13 presents kind of this messy thing for us, but it invites us to think through the issues and to say, okay, if my ethic really is loving my neighbor as myself, uh, what exactly will that look like uh, in the world? <laughs> 
and I think Paul um, says, uh, put on the Lord Jesus uh, and make no provision for the uh, flesh to gratify its desires. And I do think uh, Jackson Gravett, who helped my thinking here, um, he says that we as Christians should do the things Jesus did. Uh, Jesus on earth uh, uh, preached God's gospel. He helped uh, the poor. He uh, healed uh, those he could. Uh, and he allowed himself to suffer evil. Um, we're called to be like that. Uh, at the same time, that same Jesus, 40 years later, in vengeance, came and judged uh, the evil uh, hypocrisy. And so where are we in that? Are we only in J Jesus' life, or are there are times where in the Bible... Uh, we're meant to defend, um, and I'm persuaded by Augustine, but uh, I want you to work through that issue for yourself. Um, this is what this is one of the famous passages Augustine writes: "Inasmuch as God ordered Joshua to plant an ambush in their rear, that is, to plant warriors in hiding to ambush the enemy, we can learn that such tre treachery is not." unjustly carried out by those who wage a just war. Thus a just man, if he wishes to undertake a just war, ought to think chiefly in these matters about nothing else than whether he is right is right for him to do so, for it is not lawful for everyone to wage war. However, once he has undertaken a just war, it makes no difference to the justice of the war, whether he wins in open warfare or by treachery, However, those just wars ought to be defined as those which avenge injuries if the tribe or state which is about to be sought in war either neglected to punish a crime improperly committed by its own countrymen or neglected to repay that which had been lost through those injuries. Moreover, without a doubt, that type of war is just which God commands since there is no iniquity in him, and he knows what ought to be done in each case. It's a interesting issue. Uh, Augustine's the best uh, writer on the just war uh, side, but you be a Berean. Uh, work through the text and see uh, see what you think for yourself. We've talked uh, in here about the biblical theology of putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. And that going back to this passage, the Lord God made for Adam and his wife garments of skin and clothed them. Um, that word he uses in Greek is in duo. And that's exactly the word that's used uh, in um, uh, Romans of putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. We've seen in the Abraham and Isaac story that the only thing that would have been left if that sacrifice had happened would have been the garments of skin. And uh, with uh, the priest keeping that, you put all that together, God clothing Adam and Eve is clothing them with what should have been uh, his payment for offering the sacrifice. And if God is in the unity of the Trinity, the triune God is offering uh, Christ, then um, the bitterness that Abraham would have felt, it costs God even more than that um, uh, to cover our sin. So that's an interesting um, biblical theology. Uh, and then lastly, Romans 14 is about uh, when Christians disagree. Uh, think about some of the kinds of things uh, Christians disagree about. Um, they're minor things, you know, like should you baptize by immersion or sprinkling? Uh, what, what type of church government should you have? But there are ethical issues too. Uh, you know, uh, if 
if a couple is dating, uh, like what are the exact boundaries uh, for a relationship, Christian couple that dates? Your Christians disagree about that. Um, Christians disagree about what uh, the best translation is. When Christians disagree, how should we think about that? Well, this is what Paul says. As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but do not quarrel over his opinion. This Jewish Christian church and Gentile Christian church had a huge difference of opinion on food laws. Uh, the Jewish side said, look, we should follow all this stuff in Leviticus. That's what God told us to do as Jews. Uh, the church set of Gentiles that they did not have to follow those rules. But what do you do if you're trying to be one church when some of the people in church uh, say, oh, you can eat uh, uh, shrimp or something like that? Another group says, no, that uh, shrimp are unclean according to the laws in Leviticus. So this is what Paul says. One person believes he may eat anything while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let the one who eats, let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Uh, we might think today, um, and I, I hope you go to a church where people uh, in that church uh, differ on political uh, ideas. I, I hope you have the great privilege of uh, believing firmly something in your heart politically and then meeting a, a absolute true Christian who holds a differing view. Uh, uh, this is going to uh, fit exactly into that. He says, so when somebody comes into your church, don't try to fix all their theology. Don't try to fix all their thinking. You be, you be convinced of your view let them be convinced of their view and let God uh, work out the difference. Paul says, who are you to pass judgment on somebody else's servant? It's before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day better than another. So you can imagine the Jewish Christians all wanted to do, you know, uh, the Jewish Sabbath, Saturday. And while uh, Gentile Christians said, look, Jesus appeared on Sunday and uh, the next week he appeared on Sunday, he gave the Holy Spirit on Sunday. So I think Jesus has changed the day to Sunday. And so you've got these two people and they disagree. And Paul says, don't try to fix uh, the, the other side. One observes the day, he observes it in honor of the Lord. One who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God. While the one abstains, abstains in the honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself, none of us dies to himself. For if we live, if we, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died, lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. At the end of the day, God's going to be the one to decide uh, all these issues. Uh, As I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. Don't try to fix somebody else's theology. Don't try to fix their opinion. Uh, give, give people wiggle room to work out uh, their theology uh, under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer. Paul knew that they were doing it. He's saying stop. But rather decide this, never to put a stumbling block or a hindrance in the way of a brother. So, uh, for me, like uh, an issue uh, on this has been the issue of alcohol. Um, 
I've never had the conviction that uh, alcohol was uh, wrong for a Christian. Um, I have uh, drunk wine uh, as an adult my entire life. My mom and my dad both had alcoholic parents. And they both felt like that a Christian using alcohol at all was tantamount to renouncing Jesus. Uh, For them, there was no category for someone who uh, would drink a, a glass of wine. And so... What did I do? Uh, was it my responsibility to follow the conviction of my parents? Um, I don't think so. Um, I, I've been a Christian uh, about 40 years now, and I've been drunk one time in that time, and it and that wasn't my fault. I was in a... Um, <laughs> had gone to a church service with a British uh, Christian and uh, he ordered a drink for me and I didn't realize it was uh, as alcoholic as it was and I drank it and I realized you know I probably shouldn't be driving a car because I I can tell I'm not uh, you know (laughs) not all there but in 40 years that's kind of been my uh, I've never used alcohol to the point where I felt like I was impaired at all. Uh, I've never driven a car uh, uh, using alcohol at all. Uh, And I think within Christian liberty that that's okay. My mom and dad, if my mom and dad knew that that, uh, they're both dead now, but if they, and they do know it now, so they're probably having a chuckle right now, uh, uh, If they knew that, they would have thought that I had renounced Christianity. So when they came into our house, we would hide the alcohol, right? Because I just didn't want to, uh, I didn't want my parents to think that I had uh, renounced Jesus. But I always felt a little hypocritical about that. Uh, You know, why not just have a conversation but I didn't have alcoholic parents, and and my dad had an alcoholic uh, parent who killed himself over alcohol. Um, my mom saw her father just go down the path of alcoholism and abuse, and so I understand why their their view wasn't uh, my view. And I want to be careful. Um, Because I know that uh, having kids who grew up in our family, uh, some of them have overindulged and would say, you know, maybe we just don't need to do alcohol at all. And that makes me kind of rethink uh, is something that I could give or take. Is that really something that I should do? I don't think it's a position where someone who... Um, uses alcohol is stepping away from Christ because, I mean, Scripture says, take a little wine for your stomach's sake. It says that to, uh, Paul says that to a minister, Timothy. Um, but I do understand why uh, so many Christians in America have seen the ills of alcoholism and said, no, if you want to, um, if you want to follow Christ, you should be uh, T. Uh, Toddler. I, I think William Jennings Bryan took that uh, view. That's an issue um, where real Christians have held different opinions. And the governing principle should be love your neighbors yourself. Um, don't pass judgment on each other. I'm not going to say somebody who takes the opposite view, oh, they're clearly wrong. But I also want to make sure that I never put a stumbling block uh, or hindrance in the way of a brother. And that's a messy thing. Any kind of ethical issue is um, going to be a messy thing. Uh, So uh, we have uh, 13 and 14. There are lots of issues like that. 
uh, for uh, Christians to work through, and this is great uh, advice for us. Uh, Paul writes, I'm now persuaded in the Lord uh, Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it's unclean. For your brothers grieve by what you eat. You're no longer walking in love, but by what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. So do not let what you regard as good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating or drinking, but it is a matter of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and is approved by men. So then let us pursue what makes for peace, for uh, mutual uh, upbuilding. Whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats, because the eating is not from faith. For whatever does not 